Lesson 7 is on using inductive reasoning. And inductive reasoning, let's define that first. That's the process of finding a rule. It's different than deductive reasoning, which is all we've been doing so far. And that's mainly what geometry is about, is deductive reasoning. That's the process of applying rules. And our rules that we talk about in geometry are the postulates and properties. We apply those to find new rules, new truths. Sometimes, though, we have to find out rules. We have to figure out what the rules are. And so what we do in mathematics is we start with something called a conjecture. And that's a statement that's believed to be true. We don't know for sure if it is, but it's believed to be true. If it's proved, then it becomes a theorem. So inductive reasoning, that's basically the realm of science and the scientific method. And so a conjecture, if we think about science, that's similar to a hypothesis or an educated guess. A scientist who's going to do some research, he does some reading, he talks to different scientists, he formulates a hypothesis. He has a question that he's trying to answer or a problem he's trying to solve. And so he comes up with a hypothesis or educated guess as to what the answer to that question should be. And then he goes and does an experiment. He tests that hypothesis. And if he gets the same results time and time again, he verifies those results or repeats them. He gets similar results each time. Then that hypothesis becomes a theory. So we can see that word theory that's similar to the word theorem that we're using here in mathematics. And of course, mathematics is considered the language of science. So there's a great connection there between math and science. Now, something else that we want to define here is a counterexample. That's an example that does not support the conjecture. Let's go ahead and do some practice problems now and just think about what these different definitions mean. And in A, it says formulate a conjecture about how the next step in that pattern would be found. So you have 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. Can you see what's happening there? Each time the number doubles. So a conjecture would be to double the previous number. That would be the best way to describe that. And I'll just put a number symbol there to instead of saying the word number, double the previous number. That would be a conjecture about how the next step in that pattern would be found. Now, have I tested all numbers? No, I haven't. So I can't just turn this into a theorem right away. But I do believe that's true. I believe if I doubled 16, I'd get 32, and then that would give me, doubling that would give me the next number in the pattern, and so on. Now, what if this was the actual pattern? It kind of increased, decreased, increased, decreased. I didn't have enough information to start with. If that really is the actual pattern, that's why we call it a conjecture and not a theorem, because our statement is believed to be true, but we don't know that for certain. Now, moving on to practice problem B. Test the conjecture that if the sum of a number's digits is divisible by 3, then the number is divisible by 3. Well, let's just think of some numbers here. Let's think of 14 or 15. Let's do 15. The sum of those digits in that number, that equals 6. 1 plus 5 is 6. That is divisible by 3, meaning that we get a whole number for an answer when we divide it by 3. Let's try another one, something that's not quite so obvious. We probably already knew that 15 was divisible by 3. How about 129? If we add the digits up, 1 and 2 is 3 plus 9 is 12. Divide that by 3, that equals 4. So the sum of those digits is divisible by 3. So 129, that should be divisible by 3. And it is, it equals 43. We could try one more, let's do 51. Add those two digits up, that equals 6, just like 15 did. So 6 divided by 3, we know that's divisible by 3. 51 divided by 3 actually is equal to 17. So now we haven't exhausted that conjecture. We've only done three tests, but it does seem that that conjecture is true. But the main thing here is, is to understand what it means to test the conjecture. Well, we do something. We apply it, and we think about what it's saying, and we apply it to different numbers in this case. Okay, and then let's do a practice problem dealing with counterexamples. And it says, how might you disprove this conjecture? That sockeye, king, chum, silver, and pink salmon are anadromous. Therefore, all salmonids are anadromous. That means that they live in freshwater and saltwater. They live in both. Well, salmonids, that's a group of fish that includes rainbow trout and salmon, some other trout species as well. Now, one thing we could say here, there's several different ways we could have a counterexample. One counterexample would be to say that kokanee salmon are not anadromous. 
and I'll just abbreviate that A N A D period cocaine salmon that's actually a sockeye salmon that's a landlocked it doesn't go out to sea salmon you know they swim upstream lay their eggs and then the fish hatch live for a while in fresh water then they go out to sea and then they return to spawn cocaine salmon are landlocked they never make it out to sea so that's a counter example there an example that does not support the conjecture okay well that's all for lesson seven now one more thing to consider here about inductive reasoning if we Look at the first book in the Bible, the first chapter, Genesis 128. We start with some inductive reasoning. And, you know, we talk about these different people who have helped us understand deductive reasoning like Euclid and Aristotle and science where we understand about inductive reasoning. But God has designed our brains to work that way, to think inductively and deductively. And we look at the beginning of the Bible and we see that... God tells us in Genesis 128 to have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So have dominion means to rule over it. So in order to rule over it, we must have to find some rules out because the Bible doesn't tell us how to milk a cow or what the best fertilizer to use is or how to build a building. So God has given us a big responsibility in finding rules and being good stewards, good rulers of his creation and that includes valuing human life which begins at conception and taking care of other people and taking care of his creation managing it wisely so that we don't run out of resources we don't over exploit them and we don't get too extreme in our protection of it either okay well that's all for lesson seven